So the patent system has been a great driver of medical inventions. Uh, we've seen some terrific uh, discoveries and inventions in the medical space. But as we've, uh, as, as, as we've evolved in the system, I think we've, uh, we're starting to see, and as, a, as a lawyer who's practiced in this area, we're starting to see a lot of strategies that are played by pharmaceutical companies in order to uh, maintain their monopolistic hold or their exclusivity hold over a particular product. And what they do is they ratchet up a number of patents around a particular product in order to prevent competition from getting in. And we all know that once you have competition, prices drive down. There's a number of studies that show uh, prices can drop uh, w well below 50, uh, more than 50% if you uh, get competition in the marketplace sooner. So the idea that companies want to do is, is to basically uh, prevent that competition from coming up in earlier. And also, it, and then the other argument of that is, is, are they then really inventing new things? Uh, because what they do is they hold on to the marketplace as long as they can on the existing product. They extend the franchise out by using patents, uh, sometimes uh, with the potential of holding the market for 40 years unless litigated. And we all know that litigation doesn't solve all the problems. Um, and we've seen that in a number of the top selling drugs in the United States. We've done studies as an organization where we have seen price hikes between 2012 and 2016 on the top 12 selling drugs in the United States of uh, 68%. And we've seen in, the, in parallel to that, the number of patents that have been stacked up on those products, uh, even after the product's been approved, even after the initial, initial patent has expired, which is a 20 year term. And so they're just pushing it out further and further and further so that they can uh, delay the competition getting in. Uh, and that all leads to market power and it all leads to uh, the ability to increase prices at will. I believe that uh, there are, there, are, there are differences between, if you look at a pharmaceutical company, the scientists who work there, the, the people who work on the development of drugs, their primary purpose is to help people, I believe. I generally believe that. I believe they, the conversations I've had with people from that sector, they, they believe that if they bring a new product to market and it saves someone's life or it, it can actually make somebody uh, um, healthy, they, they really do believe that. Unfortunately, there's a business side to it as well. And so uh, what you have is for every scientist, you have probably two lawyers who are watching over them saying, OK, how can we extract a patent out of this and to make sure that nobody else gets in there? And so what we have is then you have the, particularly the pharmaceutical market, there's an argument that it's become overly financialized in terms of its investors who drive what uh, companies do rather than the, the, maybe the initially intended purpose was to deliver health products and to help make people uh, uh, not have to uh, become ill and, and, and stay alive. And I think uh, a lot of, some of that has got lost in the process as pharmaceutical companies now really start to look at their bottom line and their shareholders and what the investors want rather than what their original purpose was, was to help uh, uh, people become healthier. And I think uh, that the bargain of that has, has tilted more towards a financialization uh, of things rather than uh, thinking about health first. So IMAC comprises uh, lawyers and scientists who've come from the private practice background. We've all worked in industry. Um, I myself have been a, uh, a solicitor in the United Kingdom working for uh, the commercial side of intellectual property for over 10 years. And we've taken that knowledge to apply it in a public interest way whereby we look at uh, particularly in the, drug, in the pharmaceutical industry, how do pharmaceutical corporations strategize their patent filings in order to uh, get the maximum protection? And so what we do is we, we look at a product, uh, it could even be still in development, and we'll do, the, we'll do what we call the due diligence and the uh, analysis of all their patent filings. So for example, if it's a, pat if it's a product that uh, revolves around a small chemical compound, we'll identify what that chemical structure is, and then what we'll do is we do patent searches. You know, there are various databases that you can use. We put in keywords, we will use uh, compound searches, and then we'll find out what it is that the company has filed for. And then we track how many other patents that the company is adding on in the lifetime of the product. And that way we build up a sense of what is their entire portfolio around that particular product. And that then gives us a sense of what their strategy is what potentially is the new version of the product that they may be lining up so that what they do is typically products these days in the pharmaceutical market 
they're on the market for five years and then they'll switch it out to the next version of the product. And these patterns usually tell you what's coming down the line. So then, and we use that essentially then to make decisions and often at the behest of organizations such as Doctors Without Borders who want to get access to these products, but they say, you know, the patents are a barrier, the prices are too high. And then we'll investigate the science behind them as we're doing these analysis. And what we realize is, some, is many times uh, that the science behind it is not new. And then at that point, we decide whether we want to challenge those patents in order to remove the barriers so that competition can get in earlier. And by doing that, then uh, uh, we, we lower the, we get uh, generic competition in earlier if we're successful and prices drop significantly. And we've achieved that in, in various ways. For example, in India, we've been very successful with the HIV drug uh, Coletra, which was a, a product uh, owned by Abbott Laboratories, now Abvi. And uh, we were able to challenge the key patents on their drug and such that uh, Abbott uh, eventually withdrew all its uh, patent applications and Indian generic companies could continue to supply this particular product at a much lower price, not only to Indian patients, but also uh, many patients around the world and particularly in Africa. And so we were able to keep that market at a much uh, uh, accessible way for, um, for, for uh, people living with HIV AIDS. And, and that, that for us has been one of the greatest successes. But more recently, we've done it for the new hepatitis C drugs. For example, uh, just this year, uh, we got a decision in the drug, uh, the drug by Gilead called Sofosbuvir. We were able to win a case in China, and China has 10 million people living with hepatitis C. And the fact that we won these two cases in China now has the potential for, for other actors to come in and supply the Chinese market, which could save conservatively, if you were just to treat 15% of the uh, the people living with hepatitis C in China, that would save $13 billion. So overall, our impact of our work has the potential of saving $1 billion to the various countries that uh, need uh, to be able to get access to these drugs. Mm -hmm.